Hello, and welcome to an EDB special report on the re-entry of the Hyperion shuttle. What you're about to see is a simulation based on trajectory data that has been released, and we begin the simulation after the Hyperion shuttle has made its re-entry burn using its own RCS fuel rather than the booster pack that is attached to its tail, as you can see at the moment, the booster pack being an RL-10A3, and here the shuttle makes its rather quick maneuver to turn around and begin turning to the attitude that it will use for re-entry. Eventually it will move to a pitch of 40 degrees which is the same pitch that the space shuttle uses. However there's, there was no reason to believe that the Hyperion shuttle would necessarily use the same pitch as the space shuttle. However, for this test, they decided that that would be a good baseline to use. And so now you see it at its required pitch. These commands are all uh, delivered using Smart ASS and otherwise pre-programmed. Since the turn actually caused the shuttle to deviate from its original flight path, the RCS burst a bit in order to uh, restore it to the correct periapsis, the re-entry path periapsis being around 78 kilometers. Again, this is uh, simply a test and there was no guarantee that that was the correct periapsis for this shuttle. Uh, this is actually the view from the shuttle's own camera, and since the shuttle is uh, pointing nose up, uh, it was really only capturing the sky and the sun. Uh, so here we see the shuttle uh, currently over the Indian Ocean, and a uh, cloudy day on the Indian Ocean. We are expecting a separation of the booster pack imminent. And as it crosses into the Pacific Ocean, uh, we get that separation. The force of the separation from the booster did cause the angle of the scent to deviate again, and so the RCS was fired in order to correct that. Here now over the Pacific Ocean, the altitude is approximately 160 kilometers and already the shuttle has its air brakes out in order to increase the drag as much as possible. It is preferable to use the air brakes earlier on as it is re-entering the thinner part of the atmosphere because using the air brakes during, in the thicker part of the atmosphere would induce uh, excessive g-forces and also overheating on the air brakes themselves. This is again the camera on the craft itself, again on one of the angled surfaces of the craft so that the wing surface you see is actually one of the forward canards. Continuing across the Pacific Ocean you can see the big island of Hawaii to the left and so we are now crossing the center of the Pacific Ocean with the craft still above 100 kilometers in altitude and still pitched at 40 degrees. And as we continue, the craft approaches the west coast of North America. Not quite there yet, but uh, as it grows closer, it retracts its its air brakes and it is now descending through the critical portion of its descent where it either will re-enter or skip out and that's why it makes the pitch adjustment to ensure that it doesn't skip out. This is approximately 93 kilometers in altitude. And in fact uh, the lift of the craft was such that it was necessary to flatten out entirely and re-engage the air brakes in order to make sure that the craft did not then skip out of the atmosphere again. Approaching Baja California, it was continuing in this profile. Still above 90 kilometers in altitude. 
The intended location for the splashdown for the craft was in the Atlantic Ocean off the east coast of Florida, obviously, uh, which would have made it easier to retrieve. However, at this point, uh, anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean was going to be preferable to on land, obviously. Air brakes still out, pitch back up again though as the craft descends below 90 kilometers. Uh, RCS was engaged in order to increase the descent rate because the craft was descending too slowly. Pitch is around uh, 20 to 30, 30 degrees throughout the re remainder of the descent as the craft goes into the Gulf of Mexico, currently south of Texas and Louisiana. The goal of all the pitch angle changes uh, during this phase of the flight is really concern about the region around 40 kilometers in altitude. As we see here, the craft still pitched up with air brakes uh, crossing over Florida. Uh, the area around 40 kilometers is the, is the area of maximum heating and at that point we would like the craft to be angled up as much as possible uh, so that its uh, reflective surfaces, um, its uh, re-entry surfaces uh, bear the brunt of the heating. If the craft hits that point going too fast it will not be able to dissipate enough of the heat in order to survive and so a lot of the reason why the craft is currently angled up even though it is so high is in order to increase the amount of drag in the upper atmosphere and here we are it is crossing the Atlantic Ocean uh, heading back into the night side of the planet and still angled up trying to dissipate as much of the of the speed as possible by presenting its flat side to the atmosphere however that also means that it is descending very slowly through the atmosphere and creating a lot of lift so it's a sort of a catch here as we're trying to prevent overheating but it is taking much longer to get through the atmosphere than was first suspected here it is uh, crossing over the west coast of Africa and so so much for the attempt to uh, splash down in the Atlantic Ocean the current projection was for the Indian Ocean and so another concern was making sure it didn't actually land on Africa itself uh, in retrospect that wasn't actually much of a problem we see the beginnings of re-entry heat around 70 kilometers in altitude While the critical portion was still far away, uh, there were first indications that things might not be as the mission planners would have preferred. As around here we get an initial signal of failure from an unknown part. That's still under review. Area of maximal heating as the craft descends below 50 kilometers and is still producing quite a lot of lift at this point but as you can see trying to present as much of its protected surfaces to the atmosphere as possible. Temperatures at this point were actually lower than expected and that uh, suggested that the craft could maintain a lower pitch if necessary. As some of the heat dissipated away and the craft was uh, now entering the Indian Ocean. The pitch, as you can see, was reduced. Eventually, though, the craft was brought below safe limits and now at an angle of 15 degrees angle of attack, uh, we had a major failure. One of the parachutes exploded and that led to a uh, quick reassessment of the angle of attack and an increase to 20 degrees which had proved to be 
safe and you can see that the surface temperature gradually decreased at 20 degrees even though 15 degrees was uh, causing issues. Past the uh, area of maximal heating, now well into the Indian Ocean, the craft was safe in terms of heat. Despite the reduction in heat, the craft was still going at a significant speed, well above 2,000 meters per second, and at this point mission controllers were quite weary. After all, a quick re-entry had now turned into a more than an hour long ordeal as we tried to figure out where this craft would eventually end up. And in fact, it uh, crossed over to the morning side of the planet once again. And so within the atmosphere, it experienced yet another dawn. Heat still, still present, though not in any sort of dangerous amount. Three parachutes left on the craft, one in front and two in the back, and so the splashdown was bound to be a little bit tricky. Initial projections were that the craft at this altitude and speed uh, should have lost its ability to maintain its uh, angle of attack, uh, which the space shuttle also does at a certain point it no longer is able to maintain a high angle of attack and starts to pitch down but uh, the craft seemed to be able to maintain a high angle of attack even at uh, relatively slow speeds. We're still talking about uh, thousands of miles an hour here, but still, uh, still maintaining its angle of attack of about 20 degrees here, though slightly, slightly flattening out. Eventually, though, it did uh, lose its ability to maintain that angle of attack and adjusted to level first and then a uh, pitch down orientation. However, as it uh, reached its pitch down orientation for its glide down, it started to experience heating again. And in fact, it picked up speed much quicker than was anticipated and uh, we'll see that soon here. Remember again there are no engines on this shuttle there is only the RCS ports and those immediately started firing once the heat was detected in order to get it to a pitch up angle again in order to make sure that the heat did not damage any of its further parachutes which would definitely render it unable to splash down safely. The heat was dissipated successfully and uh, soon the craft was able to return to its nose down posture as it uh, made a very 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 long glide towards the surface of the ocean. Now approaching the west coast of Australia So for those not keeping track, the, the shuttle basically went around the world within the atmosphere of the Earth in order to make its re-entry. It actually circumnavigated the world. And this is not, this was contrary to the intentions of the mission planners. Uh, the shuttle requires about one-fifth of the world's circumference in order to make its re-entry and certainly encompassing the entire world is is not satisfactory and much optimization for the flight path will be required. Here we see the the Hyperion shuttle descending through the cloud layer It releases its parachutes relatively late. It is currently traveling below the speed of sound at this point.
and there we have parachute deployment and of course uneven parachute deployment now as there are two parachutes in the back but only one in the front and attitude control starts to have difficulty trying to maintain its pitch if the shuttle had lost an, a parachute in the back that would not have been a problem because of course the sh this shuttle does not have an engine in the back, it doesn't have a rocket in the back and that would be sensitive if it were to splash down on the ocean uh, and bear the brunt of the impact however of course the parachute was lost in the front of the craft meaning that now the cockpit was going to hit the surface first which would be far from ideal and certainly not what the mission planners were hoping to show at this point in keeping with the rest of the mission of course the shuttle's descent to the surface was slow quite an ordeal for those watching the data come in and being unsure about the fate of this this vehicle eventually once the parachutes fully deployed the craft was less tilted towards the surface with the nose down but still attitude control eventually had issues and that led to a little bit of spinning as it struggled to attempt to lift the nose. It even engaged RCS to try and make some lift but uh, that failed. This is now real time as we will watch as it approaches the surface. Here it's descending through 300 meters and descending at approximately 4 meters per second. That's certainly a safe vertical velocity for the descent of this craft, which can survive an impact of 10 meters per second. Again, no delicate engines to break off. And there we have it. Splashdown of the Hyperion shuttle. Aside from one parachute, uh, it is intact. The earlier failure, still uncertain, possibly something internal. Uh, most likely an antenna in the cargo bay. The cargo bay might not have sufficiently protected it from, from the heat or some other effects. And with that, uh, thank you for watching this special report on the, on the re-entry of the Hyperion shuttle, which was declared a success despite its, its difficulties, and we hope you will join us for future missions. Thank you for watching, and this is the EDB signing off.